Japanese literary science fiction is something we normally don't get in the U.S., like, at all. Translated science fiction in general is something of a rarity, but in its come, it's come from European authors. Authors from France, Germany, Eastern Europe. There are a variety of reasons for this, partially because European publishers already have networks set up with other European publishers to get work published, among other reasons, so it's just easy to work off those existing networks, the ones you use to get your English authors, to get them their French editions, their German editions, their um, Czech editions, or Polish editions. It's It just is easy isn't the right word, but you have the opportunity to use the, uh, the concept in reverse. This is not to say that American science fiction and fantasy, English language science fiction and fantasy doesn't get published in Japan. It does. As a classic example, the Elric series by Michael Moorcock received a full series of edition, full publication run in Japan with cover art by Yoshitaka Amano. When Viz started up their Haikasoru label to bring up works of Japanese literary science fiction to the West, short, followed shortly after by the light novel boom we're seeing now, I was very impressed to see the works that were coming out from All You Need Is Kill, which was adapted into the film Edge of Tomorrow, to Yuki Kaze, which had previously been adapted to an anime series that made it out in the U.S. well before we ever got the novel. However, the holy grail of this was the Legend of the Galactic Heroes series, which had previously been adapted into a 110-episode OVA anime series that never reached the U.S. It has built up a considerable cult popularity solely through fan subs, which basically reached enough critical mass for the novels to get licensed for U.S. release, and not long after that, the series was licensed as well. And by not long after that, I mean the novel's license was announced, and then like a couple conventions after that, the DV the English DVD release was announced from Sentai. So, as of this recording, the first three novels have been released in the U.S., with the fourth due to be released in June of 2017, though the anime has yet to come out. I have read it as of this recording, the first, all those three books, and I'll be putting out video reviews of those novels leading up to the release of the fourth, fourth book. So, after all the wait, how did these turn out? Let's find out. Quick note for my images for this, I'm going to be using stills from the anime series. I'm going to hold off on reviewing the anime proper until that comes out. I want to support the anime, in short, but let's get on with the book. Well, the first book in the series has a lot of world building and setup. While the two factions of the series fit in the two standard archetypes for this kind of story, the Free Planets Alliance being a democratic republic and the Galactic Empire being a fascist dictatorship, the power structure between the two is very different from how these normally play out, and the book spends a lot of time setting up how these work and why. Similarly, a lot of time is spent on setting up the characters and background of our two main viewpoint characters in the story. Reinhard von Lohengram on the side of the Galactic Empire and Yang Wen Li on the side of the Alliance. These two characters could not possibly be more radically different, which is why it's so vital we get time setting up these two characters. Reinhardt's closest allegory in Japanese popular science fiction, at least the chunks that Western audiences would be familiar with, would be Shar as Nobel, or Kasval Daikun, from Mobile Suit Gundam. Both are cunning passionate and driven commanders of tremendous skill who have been wronged by those within the system they are part of and seek to revenge their wrongs by subverting the system from within and overthrowing those responsible for harming them and theirs and ultimately taking control of that system. By comparison, Yang Wen Li is closest, character-wise, to a character from an anime that I have reviewed recently. That would be Shiroe from Log Horizon with a side of Randall from Clerks. Yang Wenli never wanted to be a general, he wanted to be an academic, and in particular a historian, and really only joined the military for the Free Plants Alliance version of the GI Bill. Instead, Wenli ended up repeatedly, either through the world's greatest luck or the world's worst luck, be being the right person at the right time to clean up numerous other people's mistakes, ultimately repeatedly succeeding in the face of overwhelming odds either by overcoming superior forces 
or by turning a route into a more orderly, less destructive retreat. This leads both men to meteoric rises in their respective militaries, and over the course of this book and their various successes, we see how, how well the two men fight war and get a pair of near conflicts between the two, setting up a future head-to-head -head battle that is yet to come. We see this growth as characters over three major engagements over two campaigns. The first is a battle between Alliance forces that, due to some confusion in the deaths of officers above him in the chain of command, leads to Yang turning a defeat into what can generously be defined as an informal and unspoken agreement for both sides to kind of withdraw and try again later. The second is the conquest of Iserlon Fortress, a fortress world, duh, constructed and run by the Galactic Empire. And it's placed on the only navigable route in between the two sides, which Yang takes with a force that is too small for the job and with a minimum of bloodshed. This highlights some of Admiral Yang's tactical style. His style is sort of judo-esque, aiming for the maximum results with the minimum of effort and the and with that the minimum loss of life on both sides, usually by using the strength and tactics of the opposing force against them. Consequently, Yang takes any losses his forces suffer, and even some of the losses that he inflicts on the enemy, rather personally, which leads to Admiral Yang becoming a, an alcoholic over the course of the series, starting in this book. This leads to our last major engagement. The Alliance, having seized Iserlon, and with it the Iserlon Corridor between the Alliance and the Empire, decides to go on the offensive for the first time in this war, and they quickly exceed their grasp in terms of their reach, logistically exceeding their grasp, and they're forced to withdraw due to a series of attacks by Imperial forces against their supply lines, with once again Yang Wen Li turning the battle from a rout to a more orderly withdrawal. This, in turn, leads to our contrast with Reinhardt von Lohengram. Reinhardt is a more pragmatic commander. He's not a commander who will send men to their deaths senselessly, but he's also someone who is willing to make sacrifices in order to achieve his strategic goals. Now, he's not going to again, senselessly do sacrifices, and he's not going to send people who are valuable to their deaths, he understands the loss of lot the, the weight of loss of life and that sort of thing. But he's also someone who is going who is willing to fight a much more brutal battle and is willing to inflict much heavier casualties on an opponent in order to utterly break and destroy their forces, their will to fight, and their ability to fight. Ideally for him, his style is to outmaneuver his opponents so he can obtain a big, crushing victory to dismoralize his opponents in subsequent engagements, which we see in this book, and will come up again in the next book. Now, we also see the two admirals through their aides and second-in-commands. For Reinhardt, there is his childhood friend and second-in-command, Siegfried Kirkeis, who also shares Reinhardt's ambition and ultimate aims in terms of changing the political system of the Empire from within. For Yang Wen Li, there is his ward and de facto batman, in the British military sense, and aide-de-camp, Julian Mintz. Siegfried serves as something of a conscience and cooling rod for Reinhardt's more bloodthirsty impulses, while still sharing their common goal. In particular, Reinhardt's sister and Siegfried's crush, Anne Rose, was, for lack of a better term, sold into an arranged marriage with the Emperor, Kaiser Frederick IV, in order to get Reinhardt's family out of debt. This, this sale was done by Reinhardt's father. While this elevated Reinhardt's family to the aristocracy, Reinhardt never forgave his father for this decision, and this moment basically is what laid the seeds for uh, Reinhardt and Siegfried's resentment of the aristocracy. Julian, on the other hand, is more of a sounding board, giving Yang more of an opportunity to explain his line of thinking out loud, both in terms of Yang's strategic plans and in terms of Yang's philosophical views. You get this partially through the fact that Julian, on the one hand, 
wants to emulate his adoptive father, who worships the ground he walks on. Even though he knows that were it not for Julian, Yang would be a slovenly alcoholic mess. But as part of this, Julian wants to join the military to follow in Yang's footsteps, and that's something Yang doesn't want at all. And whenever this comes up, Yang takes this op takes the opportunity to kind of try and talk his adoptive son out of this path. By contrast, Yang really, really wants to be out of the military, and his dream is to somehow just piss off the brass so much that they drum out of the service in a way that lets him keep his pension so he can write, retire, and write history books. But he knows that if he was not in charge in many of these engagements, a lot more people would have died. The empire would have taken over and if well yang could have done something to prevent all those deaths they would linger on his conscience conscience this comes up more in the second book but the themes are introduced here this leads to the prose of the story itself author yoshiki tanaka's style of writing writing is somewhat stilted and something of an acquired taste he tells the story in an almost spoken fashion with points getting brushed over or conversations getting summarized to the high points, like you do if you're recounting a series of events verbally to someone, as opposed to transcribing it or putting it in writing for prose form. Now, I read the first book in print, and while I own the other two books in print editions as well, I listened to those to second and third books as audiobooks through Audible. While I get into the meat of the narrative of those books later, I will say as an audiobook, those two books flow better read to you than they does on the page. It's an interesting point thinking about this because when you read and you listen to advice about writing, some of the universal advice they give, this is you go to conventions and hear writers talking about the writing process, or if you're taking writing classes in college or whatever what have you, one of the constant pieces of advice you get is to read your work out loud. And this is definitely one of those cases where reading your work out loud is not necessarily a magic bullet. Because out loud, it sounds great. It works one works really well, but on the page in red, it's not as not as good. It's the inverse of the problem with st some of the dialogue from the original Star Wars film, where you can write the words, but you can't say them. So, I do enjoy this book, and I do recommend picking it up, but... I will say again, you have to come in knowing that this book is set up for nine more books down the road, and the author knew that when he wrote it, and so he was going to be rating this book on the side of the world building. So keep that consideration in, in mind. It's setting up a lot of pieces and laying out the board for a whole bunch of stuff to come later. So, and later this month we will get into book two, and what happens when these pieces start moving for serious. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.